Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome to another edition of the Miss Texas Show with your co-host, Melissa Santana. Excited as always to bring you another edition of the show, but also another wonderful guest. And today's guest is um, just as amazing as all the girls that we have on, but does have this wealth of knowledge and experience because it is Linda Lee Blakemore. And Linda Lee Blakemore is not only a speaker, but also an author, an advocate, a survivor, has also been um, able to help with a lot of different organizations, um, both locally and nationally, has a class and just that she also teaches, but also just has a ton of, you know, things that she does, is continuing to do and is going to talk to us about today. So we are excited to get to know Linda a little bit more, more about her story, more about her journey, and just the incredible ways that she helps others and can connect with us. So I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. The Ms. Texas Show is a voice of hope for victims, survivors, advocates, and community leaders against gender-based violence to share their stories and resources. We began showcasing life in Texas. Today, we are impacting lives not only in Texas, but also around the world. Under our segment, Military Time, we run this segment in partnership with the National Veterans Chamber of Commerce. We invite military and veterans who have overcome traumatic events to share their experiences during and after their military service. Under our beauty segment, we invite fellow pageant winners and contestants, artists, musicians, actors, models, and dancers, and last but not least, our survivor leaders from family violence, sex trafficking, sexual assault, stalking, and other traumatic events who are ambassadors for these causes to share their lives and the impact they have made. To become a guest on our show, email us at msusatexas at gmail.com. If you would like to support victims and survivors of gender-based violence, make a tax-deductible donation to Hope Picks Global at www.hopeyxglobal.org. Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, everyone, once again to the Miss Texas Show with your co-host, Melissa Santana. Excited again, as always, not only to bring you another edition of the show, but again, our wonderful, wonderful guest. And so now I want to officially let you all know more about Linda, Linda Blackmore, who's um, currently here today because Linda Lee Blackmore, Blakemore, I'm sorry, Blackmore, Blakemore is actually a national speaker, author, advocate, and survivor. She's also a member of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence Speakers Bureau, um, also known as Voices, and her second book called An Important Addition to the Literature of Abuse and Recovery has been named a recommended read by nationalshelters.org. Linda has appeared on educational videos, national and international radio, podcasts, and television, including the Montel Williams Show, Love that show. Articles about Linda's books have appeared in national magazines, including Teen Voices, America's Family Resources, and Seventeen. Love Seventeen magazine. With her first book, Kids Helping Kids Break the Silence of Sexual Abuse, Linda traveled the country speaking at universities, roundtables, and child abuse conferences, where she educated and advocated for children. And with her current book, Entrench, which is a memoir of holding on and letting go, Linda is working with local and national agencies such as Arise, Domestic Violence Services of Southwest Pennsylvania, Dress for Success, Women Against Abusive Relationships, the Pittsburgh Women's Center and Shelter, NationalShelters.org, um, and all those to advocate for and educate women, especially those who struggle to confront their past or break from unhealthy relationships. Linda's class, From Survivor to Author, is designed to help survivors heal and share through the art of writing and storytelling. So with that, no small feat there, you have definitely done incredible things. And so Linda, we appreciate you so much for taking the time, for being with us today. And we would just love to start off by giving viewers an opportunity just to know who are you, you know, who are you, a little bit about your journey, what led you here today, all of those wonderful things. Well, thank you. Um, so what led me here today? Um, shortly after I was engaged to my second husband, um, the memories of abuse came back for me. Um, uh, really almost uh, destroyed me and certainly almost destroyed our relationship, but I held on and we persevered and we married. <clears throat> and um, at that time, I 
did a lot of hard work healing. I was working with the Pittsburgh Action Against Rape and um, they presented me with a book called The Courage to Heal. That book became my Bible. And anyone that's going through uh, the recovery process of, of uh, child sexual abuse, I, I really can't emphasize enough how important it is. At the end of each chapter were exercises, design, writing exercises. And interestingly enough, those exercises took me back to the writing that I always loved. Now I have um, a confession. Yes, I'm a published author twice, but I flunked every creative writing college course I ever took. I even had one professor tell me to give up the dream. So I did. Um, so I would like to say to everybody, if anybody tells you to give up any dream, please don't do it. Um, but those writing exercises at, at, the, uh, at the end of each chapter in The Courage to Heal brought me back to that writing. And it was writing that I needed to heal. And it was also writing that I loved. So after I got through that journey, it took so many to get me through there. I wanted to do something to give back. So I decided that I would do that by writing a story about a little girl who like me had been sexually abused. I even landed a literary agent in California. <clears throat> and every month I would send her off a chapter. And about a week later, she would send me back the red marked pages and some not nice remarks. Um, you know, Ernest Hemingway says, you know, the writing is easy. All you have to do is bleed on the page. And I was definitely not bleeding on the page. I was holding back. I, I was still not ready really to tell my story, but it takes a long time to realize what it takes to get ready. So, um, but at the end of all of, uh, you know, each, each session, this literary agent always said to me, you know, there's power in the truth. I want you to tell your true story. I want you to tell your true story. Well, my mother didn't even know what had happened to me. So I wasn't ready to tell the world. I decided then that I would volunteer at Pittsburgh Child Advocacy. I didn't have any contact with any of the children, but one day um, I, 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 two children came in for their forensic interview. And of course the story was on the lips of everyone that passed through the halls. A little boy around 10 years old had been sexually abused so severely and for so long that he lashed out raping his little sister. Um, an interesting aside is that while they were being interviewed at child advocacy, the perpetrator was at home burning down the house. So it went from, I know what, what these kids go through, right? <clears throat> so I went home and I was just uh, obsessed with these children and obsessed with the fact that prevention and intervention need to do more. So what? I, I, I had no idea what, how could I make a difference? I'm not a therapist, but I was a mother and I had four children in five years. And I knew that children are more likely to listen to each other than to an adult anytime. So that's when the idea came to me. I would write a book where children would tell their true stories to help other children understand what child abuse is, how predators manipulate and silence children, um, a book that would help to intervene if a child is trapped in silence, and of course, a book that would offer hope for healing. Each of the stories, the children's stories were accompanied by an, you know, sort of an educational chapter. It didn't take long for me to get through the cooperation of a lot of therapists and uh, even some police officers who put me in contact with, with the right people. Um, and really in about six months, that first book was written. Uh, and I started sending off book proposals to anybody I could think of, you know, victims of violent crime, Pittsburgh Action Against Rape, everybody I could think of of, you know, to get endorsements, to give the credibility to the book. Um, Erica Harkema, who at the time was with Child Advocacy, agreed to write the introduction to children. And Dr. Walter Smith, who was the executive director at Family Resources of Pittsburgh, um, agreed to write the introduction to parents, adding more credibility to the book. And the endorsements started coming in. I mean, they just, they just came. So I put together a book proposal 
And one of the endorsements I received was from Jack Canfield, the chicken soup for the soul person, uh, wrote me a beautiful full page letter. And um, so I thought I would start with his publisher, which at the time was HCI out of Florida. So I, I sent my proposal and the way they did it was they had 12 senior editors and once a month, each of the editors brought their favorite project to the table. And I made it all the way to the editor's round table, but they chose another book that they felt would sell more copies. And that was their sole reason for making the choice. Um, but in the meantime, a friend of mine um, suggested his publisher. And so I reached out to his publisher, made an appointment, went to meet with his publisher um, with my little book proposal. I, you know, I was all prepared for them to say no, but I was hopeful. And the publisher, Lighthouse Point Press, said, I don't think I've ever seen a book proposal this good ever. And I, I truly have to tell you, I have no idea what I was doing. I was just, I feel like I was the instrument through which all of this was happening and I was accepting of it and going with it. So when that book was, um, we were waiting for that book to, to, you know, the publisher was doing what publishers do. Um, that's when I received a call from Seventeen Magazine. And they wanted to know if I had a story um, about a teacher student. And I, I did not. I said, I have a father daughter internet story where father was actually selling taking photos of his daughter in the shower and selling them on the internet. And they said, no, 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 we're not interested in that. We really want this teacher stories. Okay, fine, I'm sorry, don't have it. About a month later, they called back and said, we've decided we'd like to see your story. Can you overnight us a copy of the book? Well, I didn't have the book yet. So I reached out to the publisher and the publisher sent uh, the galley to them, which at the time they did it all on paper. It was in 2004, they did it all on paper. So they overnighted to 17 Magazine, the galley. And Faith, who is in my first book, who chose to keep her name, her real name, um, agreed to tell her story for 17 Magazine. So they featured the book and they featured Faith. Um, and then out of the blue, as a result of that, Montel Williams called and invited me and Faith. They wanted me to be in the audience as the professional and Faith to be on stage. And so we said yes, and we waited and we waited. And then <laughs> one day I get a phone call. Um, we're, we've overnighted your airline tickets. You leave the day after tomorrow. So off we went to the Montel Williams show. Uh, they put us up in a hotel. They sent uh, a limousine to pick us up in the morning. And we were shuttled from the hotel to uh, a nondescript door, back door of their studio. Uh, Faith and her mom went into one green room. Uh, well, we all got our makeup and hair done. And then Faith and her mom went into one green room and I went into another green room, uh, which is not at all green. Um, and they have like a big buffet laid out for us to have snacks and so forth. But, you know, our makeup was just done. And, you know, I, I, I didn't want to have any snacks because I was quite sure I would spill something on the front of me or do something dumb. So, um, I, you know, I tried to be patient and just sit and wait. There were three shows filmed that day and we were the second one. So it was really nice. We had an opportunity to watch what happened in the you know, see all the breaks and all that kind of thing. Um, and then the show went really, really well. Um, and it aired around the same time that the book was actually released, which was nice. Um, so after that, um, I considered myself healed, even though I was still married to, uh, in an, I guess I was in an unhealthy relationship with an older controlling man um, that I just clung to. And um, every two years, just like he did to his first wife, he left me. He didn't go with me to the Montel Williams show because he, I, you know, he chose not to go. We were not together at the time. Um, and so, although I thought I was healed, I was in this very unhealthy relationship. And my second husband never put his hands on me. It was not that clear cut for me. Um, if I didn't cooperate, if I didn't 
do what he wanted. <clears throat> he would either not speak to me for a couple of weeks or perhaps he would leave me for months at, you know, sometimes. So that was more his, his, uh, his pattern. Uh, and I stayed. I even stayed when he left me for the fourth time and moved in with a very good friend of his who had been charged with possession of child pornography. Even then, after that, I took him back. I was so, I so desperately needed this man to love me. I was so unaware of how broken I, I, I really was. Um, so after we had that event and, and he came back and he wanted to come back after his, his friend went to prison, um, I took him back. And, you know, all the while I kept feeling like if I just, you know, did this or did that, I could fix it. I could fix him. I could fix us. And that's when I started journaling again. I started journaling to understand the demons that possessed my second husband. And what I found were the demons inside of me. So it was a very interesting um, experiment, I guess you'll say, but it was writing again. I started writing again. And the more I wrote, the more I began to understand myself and the more I began to understand the uh, dynamics of our relationship. Um, and there is a scene in the book where I talk about a conversation I was having at the very early onset of my um, therapy at Pittsburgh Action Against Rape, where the therapist is talking about, <clears throat> I don't know, she was talking about my abuser and I was talking about my ex-husband. I mean, yeah, at the time, you know, my husband. And she said, I'm, I'm talking about your abuser. And I said, well, I'm talking about my husband. It was so similar that I had chosen somebody so much like him um, that even though she pointed that out to me that clearly, I did not really understand. I didn't, I wasn't able to make the connection at that time. But after my second husband left me for the fifth time, I was sitting alone in the bedroom um, and I had another memory come to me. And this was another childhood memory with my abuser where my abuser came to me and said, knelt down beside me and I was nine at the time. And he said, I'm not gonna be coming back anymore. And I said, why not? And he said, well, I'm getting married. And I said, but you promised to marry me. And he said, I can't marry a nine-year-old. And you know, as a child, I said, but you promised. And he said, don't you get it? I was just practicing. And then he got up and he walked down the walkway and into the front door of my home. And he called out to my mom and dad and said, um, I'm getting married. And I realized that that moment sitting, remembering that scene um, that yes, I had dealt with one layer of my abuse which was actually the physical abuse but I had not dealt with the abandonment. And that was why I had chosen a man who every two years leaves. Um, we choose our partners as a result of our unresolved trauma. It's our past. We choose our partners um, for, for many reasons that to remember to get the outcome we didn't get as a child, which was for me, um, to confront our unresolved issues, uh, to get control over something that we um, didn't have control over as a child. Absolutely. I didn't know if you, <laughs> I was so engrossed in like, you know, what you were sharing and all of that, but um, definitely can't agree more. And I appreciate you even sharing all of that um, and definitely an incredible journey to have been on. But I also think, there's so many incredible things that you shared, but I think too that 
you're also touching so much on how trauma unfortunately operates. And so it's just incredible for me to hear that you actually unlock some of those memories in the midst of another relationship. Like, you know, not not purposely, you know, like choosing to like, oh, today I'm just going to go ahead and dive into my memory bank and, you know, this is going to come up. But that's how deeply entrenched it had been, you know, like it's definitely been buried for it to then be able to even come out in the first place. So like for that to even happen, I mean, it just, you know, it definitely goes to show. And I think for any individual who has experienced trauma and has had those similar experiences, this is why we, you know, cannot echo enough and just like advocate enough and let you know that that is completely normal for those things to happen because trauma itself is not a normal thing. We're not meant to go through these kind of events. We're not meant to be exposed to any type of abuse. And so naturally, yes, we don't react. We, first of all, none of us all react the same way, but we absolutely, trauma definitely affects our brain in different ways in that way. And sometimes it is with the bearing of the memory. And so I mean, I'm glad that you have found these ways now, naturally, you know, to like now deal with it. And so, and you're doing such great things because, you know, you almost forget about that when you're hearing the abuse, you're like, wow, like what happened? Like, I mean, are you, is that, is that, is that little girl still okay? Is that, are they fine? And it's great to hear that. No, you now are this wonderful person that's, you know, sitting before me that does all these great things for other people, but it's definitely makes sense that that is what can happen because unfortunately, especially when you deal with abuse as a child and don't even know how to make sense of it, it absolutely can, you know, bury itself in that way, but then come back at a time that you weren't necessarily expecting. So I think, and that was actually going to be my next question is that, um, I know you've written about it. I know you have a memoir now and, you know, all these things. And I definitely encourage, you know, viewers to, you know, get it. And I'm going to, you know, definitely give you space to tell us more about it. But I was going to say that, like, other than, you know, and I, I mean, and if you don't mind sharing about the abuse, but even just as a child, like the person before the incredible writer, the author, the advocate, I mean, in general, like, did you also write as a kid? Like, what was life like as you was a kid? Were you also very thoughtful? Like, I'm just curious, what was life like for you growing up before all of these other th wonderful things happened? As far as writing, yes, I always loved to write. Even as a child, I could be found, you know, sitting on my bed with a, with a tablet and a pen. And that, I think, came out of the fact that I also never really felt like I belonged. I never felt like I was the same. I felt different. Um, I felt this uh, discontentment inside me that obviously was the trauma that needed to come out, that needed to be addressed, but I didn't understand it at the time. Um, and so I grew up really feeling like um, if I just, if I just graduate from high school, it'll be better. If I if I marry my high school sweetheart, it'll be, it'll be better. If, um, if we have children, it'll be better. Um, but, you know, my first husband and I had four children in five and a half years. And all that did was leave me exhausted with all the discontent. So then I decided if I get a job, it'll be better. And that's really when the, when the trouble started because um, I was, I was, had gone out after work with a friend and I was selling real estate at the time, which I have done now for, I don't know, 37 years. <clears throat> and she, I, I needed to unwind and she was having a, a difficult sale that she, you know, she was single and she really needed this sale to close. And so we had chosen a table in the far corner of the room because we wanted to be alone and we wanted to talk. And this, you know, lanky guy, um, came up to our table and he kind of put his elbow between the two of us and, you know, looked at me and, you know, what do you do? And I said, I sell real estate. And um, he said, oh, I'm looking for a house. And it, the trouble really began. He was narcissistic and demanding. He was not honest with me. It was a very difficult relationship. He asked me to please leave my husband so that we could have a proper relationship, which of course I was so enamored with him. Like I was so drawn to this man, the way the daughter of an alcoholic might be drawn to a drinker. It was definitely out of my control. And I didn't understand that. My friend kept saying, don't do this, don't do this. Well, I did it. And he and I had a relationship for about 18 months. Um, and then one day I realized, you know, we, I, we were in it about nine months when I realized he was married and then he finally admitted it to me. And um, about 18 months into this relationship, I, you know, 
I guess I accepted the fact that he was never going to be honest with me. He was never going to leave his wife. And there were probably other women. Um, and so I told him we had gone out to dinner. And um, when we came home, I said, to him, I, you know, I, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And unfortunately, he was not done. So even though I kicked and I screamed and I carried on, um, he did not stop. And our relationship ended that night after he sexually assaulted me. And there's a statistics that stands out to me. And that is, you know, first of all, we, we know that one in four girls and one in six boys is a victim of child sexual abuse. But many people do not know that a victim, a child victim of sexual abuse is five times more likely to be re-victimized as a teen or an adult. And of course I fit into that. Um, and it's because, you know, we, we choose our partners, yes, based on, uh, on all of this stuff, but our past formulates our self-worth, how we believe we deserve to be treated. And so, you know, who we choose as partners is a part of that and what we're willing to accept from those partners is another part of that. Um, and, I, and I did put myself in an, in an unhealthy situation and I blamed myself. I never reported it. I never told anyone. Um, like most victims of intimate sexual assault, you know, I thought, well, if it's somebody I've been intimate with and somebody that I chose to be with, then isn't this my fault? And of course, now I know that it's not my fault. Um, and I, I even did recently a video uh, talking about what had happened to me and uh, making sure that other women understand that it's not your fault and you're not alone. Absolutely not. And I think incredibly too, it's also just not uncommon, unfortunately, to end up in these unhealthy situations when you've already been exposed to the kind of, you know, like abuse and, you know, unfortunately trauma that you had experienced even as a child. I mean, I think it was so heart-wrenching to hear you say that as a nine-year-old, you were literally telling this person like, well, what happened to the marriage? You know, the promise of marriage that you promised to me at nine, poor at nine. Like sometimes we imagine, you know, our lives in the future when we're nine. I mean, we might, you know, picture different things, but to already have, you know, internalized that you were going to marry someone who unfortunately was abusing you. So like not knowing how to separate those two things and obviously in the process, not really being able to enjoy your childhood the way that you should have been able to because you were also you know dedicating all this time to that mm -hmm. yeah it, it's really sad because my uh, my whole view of a relationship was distorted as a result of that and it takes a long time to find center it takes a long time I, I, I think I would say that healing it, you're never done healing it's a journey you never get there. You always are healing. And for me, writing was uh, my pathway to getting to center. So, you know, after I remembered all of these things, <laughs> I couldn't write fast enough. It was like it was pouring out of me, you know, and, and I encourage everybody, no matter what you choose to do with your written word, when you write something, it separates it from you. It gives it a life of its own. You can take it out and read it anytime you want, but it's no longer inside you, keeping you anxious and holding you captive. Um, so it really is very freeing. Um, and I, I joined some writing groups because this was a different kind of writing and I wanted to hone my craft better and I wanted to be around people that I could safely share my story with and learn from. Um, and so we had this wonderful group of women who we got together once a week and we wrote and we gave each other critiques and we supported one another when we cried and all the things that you do. Um, and after I remembered that whole scene um, and I got it all down on the page and I brought my story to a close, I, I no longer felt the need to do anything with it. So I had this manuscript and it was, you know, 75, whatever thousand words. And <clears throat> I sat down across the table one day and I said, I'm, I'm done. It's written. It served its purpose for me. I no longer need to do anything. And my friends were so disappointed, not because they didn't, you know, they didn't think I could get it published or, you know, whatever, but they were disappointed because they really felt that my story might help somebody else. 
And I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, who's going to want to read my story, you know, but one day I was asked to go to lunch with a young lady who was having a lot of trouble in her life. She was making some bad decisions in her relationships. And so I went to lunch with her and I knew I could give her some sage motherly advice and tell her what to do and all those things. But I also knew she would be more likely to really relate to my story. So I gave her an over lunch sized version of my story. And when we were done, she got up and walked around the table and she said, you have helped me understand myself more by telling me your story than anything else. I, I, it, it was just sort of a light bulb moment for her. And as I walked back to my car that day, I said, you know, as terrifying it is to put yourself out there as such a damaged individual. I mean, I was choosing bad partners and staying with people and, you know, just the things when you're, when you're a mother and you're making these decisions, your children aren't first. They're just not. And so to really put myself out there with all that kind of honesty was terrifying, but I decided that I had to take a chance and I had to do it. Um, so that's what I did. So I reached out, you'll, you'll kind of get a chuckle out of this. I reached out to my first publisher and I told him and he said, well, I'll publish it if you change your name. <laughs> and I said, isn't the credibility of memoir being willing to put yourself out there? So I reached out to a media lawyer in New York and he said in, in his very pragmatic way, the people who know you are going to know you no matter what name you use. And the people who don't know you aren't going to know you no matter what name you use. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and I thought so true. So I just decided to go ahead and use my name. Um, and then, you know, I, I did all the, all the things that writers do, right. I, I, found a pub, I found a, um, an editor, you know, I went through the whole process of doing all of that. I really wanted it to be the best book it could be, right. um, partially because I'm OCD, partially probably because I, everything I do, I never quite feel good enough, you know, so I'm always trying to, to do things the best that they can. Um, but I just felt that if the book had any chance at all, it needed to be the best it could be. Absolutely. And I think it's, in, um, and knowing that, I think, like you said, um, not, I don't want to give a shout out to that one. Uh, was it like teacher or professor? It might've been. Cause like you said, I don't, I'm, I forgive you were in college or what, you know, which grade yeah. level, but like we said, no, I mean, I, if anything, it's an unshout out to that person. Um, but I just can't believe like the fact that they would even say that the fact that, you know, writing has definitely carried you all this time, but it, it's also incredible how people don't always realize how critical those messages can be when we hear them, like, you know, both positive or negative. I mean, sometimes, well, especially we, we definitely tend to carry the negative ones more though. I mean, let's be honest, as human beings, we're critical of ourselves. We're absolutely critical of feedback that we get, but especially something like that. So it's, it, I'm so glad that you did not, you know, eventually found your way back to writing, but like just hearing all this, I'm like, wow, I can't believe there was somebody that told her to just give that up. <laughs> so like, my goodness. Um, and that people like that, you know, exist in that way. And I hope that person is eating their words now, but I am glad. I'm glad that you found your way. And I mean, of course that was also going to be my other question about it, but you definitely have touched on it, but clearly writing has definitely helped as far as the healing is concerned. And it was interesting to me too, that you, you shared that raw honesty too, that at one point you thought you were healed. You, you got to that point with the show. It was like, cool, I've arrived. <laughs> I'm here. And like, it just felt like that good cathartic moment. And so like, you know, here you were, but you know, as you have discovered, and as a lot of us continue to discover whether we want to or not, yeah, the healing doesn't stop. <laughs> and like the discovery doesn't stop, the growth doesn't stop. <laughs> like there's always new levels that we can unlock. There's always new potential that we can try to, you know, engage with. So like, it's just interesting to hear that. But it, it is also interesting to hear that writing, you know, help propel that. But I am curious about that. Like you said, like, do you think it was just the writing? Do you also think it was the incredible support system? Did you have like, what do you think propelled your healing the most? I think it, you know, I, I have had in my life a few therapists that I saw once and knew they were not the right person. But I have also been blessed with many, many therapists who I have to say, um, it took me a long time to really internalize and understand the messages that they were trying to send to me. But when those words and that wisdom got it in there eventually, wow. 
I had one therapist and I opened my story with this. Um, my second husband, I don't know which time it was, probably the last time <clears throat> he left me. That would have been the fifth time of our marriage, two times with um, our engagement. So, you know, the average woman leaves seven times before leaving for good. I, I'm the statistic. I, I think I check all the statistical boxes. I'm like, I should be the poster woman. But I went in to see this therapist and I was crying and I, you know, she's, I was telling her, you know, we, we are apart again. And she said, what do you want? And instead of wanting to be independent and leave him and find the strength and all that stuff, I wanted a miracle. And she literally said to me, I can't help you if you want him back. When you talk about the pivotal moment for me, that was the pivotal moment. I walked out of her office knowing that I was like an addict. You know, and a trauma bond is like an addiction. And I had that kind of a trauma bond with my second husband. I could not break free of that. The uh, abandonment was so strong inside of me. And of course, I didn't understand it yet. But every time he left, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like my world was ending even though through each of those separations that we went through, I grew stronger. I became more independent. Um, I was developing my social network. I was building a little nest egg for myself. I was doing all the things that I needed to do because I had guardian angels along the way who would give me good advice and I, I, I would follow it. Um, but I was still hanging on to him. And then when that therapist said that, I went home and I knew, I, I, she, I knew she was right. I never went back to her, but believe it or not, I didn't take him back either. So. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely fascinating. And then like, but also like, it's it just incredible how that that also stayed with you and so like it was definitely like rang true you know you definitely still took it with you and so you know and with that person and now that person does get a shout out unlike the professor that gave the bad advice <laughs> that person is great and gave that message but but it was great for you to know that and to be able to like recognize that you know regardless of that that is what you needed to do to be able to help and that you know you no longer needed to keep that connection going but it absolutely makes sense why at one point you did just because I mean it's definitely something that you know was familiar to you unfortunately given you know the abuse abuse looks very comforting when you've had it and so when that is what you've experienced it, it has it does become your reality especially when you endure it as a kid I mean you know it was was your life at one point and so like it's all I knew yes it exactly. was all I knew mm -hmm. and I agree I definitely agree like for you to you know see that and know that and so you didn't really know anything else and so it is incredible to know that but I am I'm glad you like did break free from that but I am curious so then you did leave your first marriage for this person um, because they asked you to because I heard you say that and so like was the first marriage at all unhealthy either would you say that like you know, I was, I'm just curious how like the first marriage had went. I really left a kind and loving man, a good father and a good husband, <clears throat> because something inside of me was taking me away. Right. Um, I, I couldn't be satisfied with kind and loving. Mm. I was in search of, I think, this trauma bond and recreating the outcome I did not have as a, as a child. So my first husband and I were about a year apart in age. The yep. first time I left him for this married man, he was 14 years older than me. I went back to my sec my first husband who took me back mm -hmm. and I was still in this level of discontent. And the second time I left was for the man who became my second husband who became the foundation for me to remember. Sure. And um, he was also 15 years older than me, just like my abuser. So right. I tell people that my second husband, as hard of a journey as that was, he became my pathway back to mm -hmm. remember and confront my abuse. It, it was a very difficult journey for me uh, because of my trauma. 
I, I'm sure he would be very different with another person than he is with me. He has his own issues. I, I'm not excusing those, but I do, I am grateful to him because it would have, I would have been going through that journey with somebody else. And maybe it would have been somebody who would have physically abused me also. Uh, right. So not that I'm saying that, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that I had an unhealthy second relationship, but I guess I realize from some of the women that I work with and help yeah. with that it could have been far worse for me than it was. Oh, no, absolutely. And I think what's fascinating about what you're revealing with that, though, is that how we reject what's good for us when we've been when we've been exposed to abuse for so long. Like, I just remember not only like myself in that situation, times where I've done that, but also like even like children that I work with now, like you said, you also work with, you know, currently with also other abuse victims and, and survivors and also who deal with that. And yeah, how many times does that come up? And I've also had countless conversations about trying to help them unlearn how, no, you do not seek out those same behaviors. I know that they seem good to you. They seem attractive to you which is the real big danger um and so like yeah and you want to get engrossed in that but no you actually deserve better than that please veer away but how hard is that to do so that's why I think it's I'm glad you revealed that and like you know we can share that but yeah I don't think that's talked about also enough is that you know we can do that we can honestly that is the danger without being able to deal with the trauma is that we can absolutely relive it but also that we seek it out because we have not dealt with it we don't know we haven't processed it properly and so we do seek it and we do see it as something attractive to us instead of something dangerous like it's incredible how that you know can be the effect that it can have so definitely yes i you know i i tell people a trauma bond um you know think think lightning bolts and fireworks and when you feel that attraction to somebody and you feel like you've known them forever even though you just met them that's a sign Yes. that's a sign there's something there and it's most likely not something good yeah. even though that feels so wonderful and and the attraction is <laughs> it's so strong it's almost impossible to resist it right. but it's equally that bad but when you're going through it it's automatic so right. much of what we do is on an unconscious level it's automatic we are responding to what we need, even when what we need isn't good for us. Right. Oh, absolutely. And I was thinking too, as you were saying that, is that, and how often does the media glamorize that and make it seem like those are the attractive relationships? So really like instant spark, those like ones that are really like clingy and attaching to you and want all of your attention. And it's like, well, actually, no, we're here to dispel that myth. Like that is not necessarily what healthy is. And healthy requires a lot of work too, not only in a relationship, but just on your own. Like it's not this easy thing to do. So no, we know that that's not, it's not an easy act, but it's a worth it. It is a worth it ask. Like it's definitely does help to, you know, get you to that better life that you so much deserve. And then you can definitely, you know, walk in the great potential and passions that, you know, you are now doing. So I just think, you know, it's amazing. And I'm glad to hear that, you know, writing help with that therapy help with that and then in the midst of this like you said you're also still a mom so like I mean I'm assuming your relationship with your children has also evolved as a result of all of these great things but you know even that would you also say that you know you've also that has happened and that you're able to have more fruitful conversations with your children now that maybe you couldn't have had before I have I'm so blessed I have wonderful children two wonderful stepchildren I do feel like I owe my children more of myself now than perhaps I would have felt. Um, but they are very supportive of my writing and very supportive of my healing. And we are a very close family, very close family. Um, and I'm blessed. I'm blessed and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be healthy and here. I mean, some people don't get their moms long-term and right. I'm here and I'm trying to make up for every single minute that I was otherwise focused. Right. Oh, absolutely. And then mm -hmm. speaking of that too, what would you say is also the most rewarding part of the, of the work you do now? I know you shared a little bit about experience you've had with helping other survivors and with the advocacy work you do and all of that, but yeah, what's, uh, what's been the most rewarding there? Well, it's, I think it's all rewarding. Um, I, if I can make a difference for just with just one person, 
Absolutely. I give that 110% of my attention at the moment because that person needs that and deserves to be happy and healthy and to find their journey through. And uh, whatever I can do, I, I want to do it. And I want to do it 110%. And, and I'm, you know, it's like anything, the more you give, the more fulfillment you get. I'm not looking for making millions, you know, as well as I do selling books, you don't make money, but it's just a wonderful process to be able to share my journey and share with others that you can find happiness. You can find wholeness. Right. You really can't. And you can find respectful, reciprocal love. Absolutely. It's out there. You don't have to accept someone who treats you poorly or someone who doesn't love you back. Right. You're, you're worth it. And it's out there. Absolutely. I definitely agree. And I think it's incredible too that, you know, it, it did so much for you at the beginning, just being able to write your own story, which was definitely worth writing. And so like anybody who has a story out there that they're sitting on, you know, you're definitely, I hope you're hearing the encouragement today that go ahead and write it. Um, this is your sign. You should definitely get it out. It can definitely be helpful, not only for yourself, but for others. But that's what was incredible hearing from you too, that it helped you at the beginning, almost to the point where you were done. <laughs> you were done. You said, I don't need to do anything else with this, but you had that incredible incredible tribe behind you and wonderful supporters that were like, well, no, I could definitely see this impact helping others. You saw it for yourself, like when you have that sit down, but it's just, you know, you're still able to do that. And I think that's honestly the best reason, right, to get into this kind of thing and to genuinely just want to be able to help others. But it's also incredible that I think, you know, like you said, your relationship with your family is blessed, but also clearly, you know, the way you're able to impact others has been blessed also. I mean, you've definitely been able to secure a lot of great opportunities and connections, both on the show and then with the all these other things that have come but like you said it, it was great with that step that you took like being able to share that story and then naturally all these other connections were able to come as a result so it's definitely a great thing to witness but then it just you know goes to show the testament of why that healing helps and like what you can then do with it once you're able to you know engage in that and it's sad when you know the the level that's out there and how much help is really needed. You know, Absolutely. I'll say to my husband, oh, I'm gonna take a week or two off. I'm tired, I need a break, whatever. And then the phone will ring. Right. You know, will, will you do this or will you do that? And so, you know, I, I, I do feel like I'm doing this for a purpose and there's a higher power that's saying, nope, you're not done yet. I'll let you know when you're done. And so, um, yeah, you know, I'm gonna keep doing it as long as the need is there. Absolutely. Oh, that was actually going to be my next question. So what do you think the future holds for Linda? Like, what other things do you hoping to do? Do you think you have more books in you, more work? Like, what do you think the future, you know, has in store? I, I think that I can't answer that question. <laughs> I have no idea when I wrote my first book that I would have ever written a second one. I'll right. never say that I won't write again. Right. But for right now, the immediate need is for me to focus on doing what I'm doing. I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping to help um, other survivors become authors and Absolutely. storytellers for their own, you know, healing and also for what they bring to the table to help others. Um, and I'm just working with the organizations. We're doing videos right now. It's a lot. Of, it's it's a, it's exciting. And it's a lot of fun. Right. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of videos. I have one posted and then, it, you know, I, I'm not real fast at at doing them because I'm not all that tech savvy, but um, they're coming together. And I, I, you know, I know that people connect with a face and a voice in, we are so lucky to have this media that we can use. So I'm working on, you know, just sharing little snippets of my story and, you know, along with statistics and strategies to help, help women. Ooh. Wonderful. Well, and speaking of help with women, it's also wonderful to hear that there is hope and life on the other side. And so I know you mentioned um, a husband that uh, you currently, now you have. And so like, what, what was, uh, I don't know when you, when you met, like how, you know, I, I can tell that, you know, it's going well now. So like, you know, we want to remind viewers, see, it can all work out in the end. But I am curious, like how that, you know, how you came to, you know, be in that and any advice you have for others that are hoping to, you know, find their healthy relationship in the future. Well, I would say to others, don't worry about finding a relationship. It will come when it's ready. Um, and 
focus on being as healed as you can and as healthy and centered and whole, because then you're more likely to be attracted to someone who's centered and healthy and whole. So um, I was not too far prior to getting divorced from my second husband when um, I went to a fundraiser with a friend mm -hmm. and he had been, he was older than me. <clears throat> it was a friend of my dad's and he got me an attorney and answered questions when my second husband would do something crazy. And I would say, should I react to this or what, you know, what should I do? Right. And one day he said to me, look, I've got this fundraiser and I don't want to go alone. Would you go with me? And we were just friends. And, and I said, sure, absolutely. You've done so much for me. So I went to this fundraiser and it was a silent auction. And, um, I was off looking at the tables while my friend went to talk to some of his buddies and come, up behind me, this Texas, this voice with a Texas straw. I was looking at this mannequin with a homemade suit. That was the prize. And I thought, what a gift. And so I get this man come up behind me and he says, you're not gonna bid on that now, are you ma'am? And I turned around and I said, why do you want it? And he said, as a matter of fact, I do, but you probably want that for your man. And I said, I don't have a man. And he said, <laughs> and he's very bashful. So this is not like him at all. But he said, well, do you think you want one? And I said, you know, maybe I do. <laughs> and so we met and um, been together ever since. And, you know, I didn't speak to him. I didn't see him for three or four weeks. It wasn't that um, firework thing. I, I, I thought he was sweet and I thought he was, um, you know, handsome and all those things, but I didn't feel that, I just didn't feel that trauma bond. Yeah. And that was new for me. And I wasn't really quite sure what to do with it, you know, but I thought, oh, he's nice and we could go out and have dinner and, you know, it's okay. Um, but I wasn't looking for anyone. And three or four weeks later, whenever it was, he asked me if, um, you know, we could have a cup of coffee and we did. And then after that, we went and we had dinner, you know, and it, it was, a, it, it felt like it was fast once it happened, but it was, it, but it was much slower and much healthier and much different than my other relationships were. Right. Ooh. Which is awesome. And so, and yeah, see, it's not necessarily, like you said, something that you have to look for. It can find you at the right time. And you don't necessarily have to make that your priority. You make yourself the priority. And then these other wonderful things can come. And so, yeah, definitely it's amazing to hear that. But I also love that, you know, that did happen for you. And so like, now you have that, you have this wonderful union that you weren't even looking for in particular, but that, you know, you definitely, you deserve it, of course, always, but now you can enjoy, which is wonderful. So yes. And so with that, I was also going to say with all these wonderful tips that you've shared and all these great things, how is it that individuals can connect with you, learn from you, get the books, all these other great things? How can they do that? Okay. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, they can reach me through my website, which is my name, lindaleeblakemore.com. Um, there's a contact me button in there and that's the easiest to remember and the easiest way to find me. The books are, of course, are available where books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, you know, all those kinds of places. Um, if somebody would like an author signed copy, they can order it through the website of the publisher, leonellapress.com. And then Leonella sends me the order form and I sign it and I ship it out for you. <clears throat> so that's very nice. It's a small publisher and we have a great relationship. So we worked out a way to do that while well, supplies last, but I still have some. Um, so, you know, it just depends, but I, I would, I would st strongly recommend that um, women who are going through this read, they read book, how-to books, um, they read memoirs, and most of all, write journal get it on paper separate itself from you um put it don't mail letters you can write letters to the child inside you and to the people who didn't protect you to the people who hurt you but please don't mail them <clears throat> there's a scene in my book where i decided i was going to mail my letter <laughs> to my abuser and i had my little ratty pink mickey mouse you know night shirt on and i 
padded my way to my car and I drove myself to the big blue mailbox. And as I held down the handle and I, I held the letter in my hand, you know, and I came to my senses because I didn't mail it. I got back in my car and I, and I went home. Um, so stuff them in a shoebox up in the top of your closet, but take them down when you need to revisit them. And if you're writing, date your pages so that you can see and really follow your progress. You can watch yourself growing and healing in the things that you're writing. It's pretty amazing and oh. very encouraging. Oh, absolutely. And that is what I was going to ask too. I was like, is there any other tips that you wanted to share? And you got right on, see, like perfectly, because I definitely think that is such a great tip. And it's definitely not something we always think about, you know, being able to track that, see that progress and really have that tangible, you know, example of, of that, of that recovery and of that growth and of that, you know, development that we do, you know, go through, but that is a great way to do it. Definitely by doing that and, you know, marking it and, you know, seeing it there on paper. So I definitely think that that, you know, is amazing. But I also love that, you know, as you mentioned, that there are, you know, different ways to be able to connect with you. And I love the author's copy. I love that's super cute, like to have it, you know, sign in all of those wonderful things. So I'm glad that, you know, you have that. But like I said, I also really appreciate the tips specifically, you know, for future writers and like how that can be beneficial and, you know, how that can help them. So is there anything else, Linda, that you would like to be able to share with us today? The only thing I would say is, you know, as women, we need each other. And oftentimes we are so focused on our jobs and our children and our spouses and our homes that we do get isolated from each other. But it, that isolation can in, in and of itself, you know, keep us entrenched in, a, in an unhealthy relationship. And it is through our relationships with other women that we can um, seek support, um, find strength. If somebody is in an unhealthy relationship, you know, there's some things they can do. One, you can get an action plan through like the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence to try to save your nickels if you can. Um, get all of your personal important paperwork, put it in one spot or better yet, give it to a close friend. Um, you know, establish a place to meet in the case of an emergency and a safe word with that special friend if you are in a relationship where there is, you know, some potential for danger, you know, keep a spare set of keys handy so that you can make a quick getaway if you need to, even keep a bag packed if you need to. Um, and remember, we find ourselves in these positions, but that doesn't mean that we are at fault. And it is really hard to get out. So please seek professional help because we can't do it alone. We can't, we need our friends and we need some professionals to get us through the journey. But Absolutely. if you do that, you can, you can find happiness, wholeness, and healing. Ooh, can't agree more. And it was so good that I don't even want to ruin it. I just would say to echo that though, I do think that there's definitely strength in numbers. And I also love how you're shedding light on the fact that, you know, oftentimes we do think that we're the only ones going through the situation. There couldn't possibly be anyone else going through the same thing, making these like senseless decisions. And like, I, I've got to be the only one by going through this. We're here to tell you that is the furthest thing from the truth. <laughs> there are absolutely people who have been in your situation that can relate to your situation and can absolutely ultimately help you as you are trying to escape that situation that's why it's like it's helpful to seek that counsel and you know have that but also just have that community of support and sometimes it's people that you might already have but it might be people you don't even know yet and so it could be the people that might end up helping you absolutely with that but you've definitely shared some incredible knowledge and I see like your you know wonderful connections like with these organizations and it's evident to me like not only the passion you have behind it but just the great knowledge and experience that you bring to it so um you know I definitely appreciate that also and I love that you did share you know what parts you know I know I had I worded it as what was rewarding and as you said like all of it is but there clearly is a lot that you know I can definitely say that it, you can also be proud of because I mean that you know I'm and it's clear that you know and that you care about it because it's a lot of great work that I see is you know being done so I definitely think you know great kudos on it but also that it's great to see because I definitely think it's individuals with this kind of passion and experience that we need to have doing this work given how hard it is especially when it comes to any violence but also domestic violence is definitely a very complicated one our justice system is not set up in the most survivor-centered way and so we definitely need all the help we can get when it comes to these situations yes sure. ma'am and if I did it anybody can do it 
Ooh, amen. <laughs> Y'all heard it here. So please, I hope viewers, if anything resonated with you or anything that you know you heard and you want to learn more about, please reach out to Linda. You've heard the ways that you can do it, uh, but definitely. And not only do we thank you, Linda, for being with us today, but also viewers for tuning in and always the support that you show. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So you. Much, Melissa. Thank you.